Welcome to my office. What a piece of engineering. Not exactly the place when you expect women to work. And you're right. At this moment, in my profession, it's only me, female, working there. I'm the commercial diver, and I maintain this structure underwater, offshore, on the North Sea. When we think about the diving, we very often think scuba diving. Mm -hmm. Light equipment, pleasure, tropical waters, great visibility, warm, lovely beaches. But the North Sea is a completely different story, diving there. The weather is very cold. Visibility can be terrible. And the weather can be also very bad. That's why we very often call it the washing machine. But we don't dive in these conditions. When it comes to gear we wear underwater, imagine astronauts in space. They wear these special suits which protects them and enables them to work in their environment. Without those suits, they wouldn't survive. So we divers use similar system. We wear heavy-duty helmet. It is heavy. It weighs about 18 kilograms. Imagine having 18 kilograms gym kettlebell weight on your head and work with this for a couple of hours. Everyone could struggle. This helmet is very well sealed on our head, on our neck. It keeps us dry inside and warm. It protects us and enables us to breathe under this enormous pressure. Because there is the difference between astronauts and the divers. Astronauts deal with no gravity, and we divers deal with this crushing pressure. To our helmet and our safety harness we wear on top of our suit, we've got the connected umbilical, our lifeline. Bundle of hoses which supply breathing air from the surface. It supplies hot water to our suits to keep us warm down there in these cold seas. It supplies also, also power to our camera and our light on our helmet. And also communication because we communicate with the people on the surface, our supervisors, engineers, people who guide us in our work, people who keep us safe down there too. We use very heavy tools, complex tools. We work only one or two divers at the time in the water. We have sometimes very complicated tasks which involve whole team on the surface. Our work involves construction, inspection, the commissioning, maintenance, also welding, and much more. All is called sub-engineering. Just being under pressure is quite tough. Wearing this old equipment, these tools. It is very demanding, very physical, and also dangerous work. It all doesn't sound so well, huh? So what made me to decide to become this commercial diver? I was always into challenges in my life, especially when it comes to the water. I, bo I was born a competitive, competitive swimmer in Poland. So water became my passion. I pushed myself harder. I did longer, deeper free diving, solo cave diving, exploring, diving under ice, wrecks, and more. But the turning point for me was training Polish Special Forces and Emergency Services. And they introduced me to this commercial diving. And at this point, I knew that this is something what I really want to do. I want to be this commercial diver. I wanted to work on this oil rigs. It was my next challenge. So I was very excited and I shared it with my friends. And guess what they said? You are crazy. <laughs> it's not for, for you. Just forget it. Well, I clearly didn't listen. Now I needed just a lot of money I didn't have for my course. I had to learn a new language and gain a lot of courage. So I don't give up on the way because I knew that it would be very hard. <laughs> Opportunity of scuba diving work came of Libyan waters on the tuna boats. I called them straight 
But initially I was rejected because I was a woman. Strange. But I didn't give up. I thought like, what can I lose? I really wanted this job. So I called, I found someone to talk to, someone who gave me a chance. I could hear, can you do this work? It is very hard. I was like, yeah, yeah, of course I can do this work. I had no idea if I can. <laughs> but I got the job. And I worked a few months on the sea with crew who never worked with women before. Work was not easy, but I managed. And even when the living conditions were not the best. But the people were amazing, and adventure was even better. So, yeah, I did this job. And the most important, I have earned my money. So I went to the school in Scotland, and even with my poor language <laughs> at this time, everyone was very supportive and encouraging, and I passed with the high marks without any problems, and I became this commercial diver. So with determination and probably some luck too, I had a lot of work, inshore mostly, smaller work, but don't take me wrong, it wasn't easy. I was very often rejected for the same reason, like before. But I kept fighting through that. I never took no for answer. And I always found someone who gave me the chance. So even in the countries like Georgia, Black Sea, or Yemen, when the culture is completely different and women are not accepted in this kind of work, I did well. In Georgia, they kept asking me, how your parents allow you to leave your home? How can you be with men together and work with them? What could I answer? <laughs> In Yemen, I was really invisible for the local workers on the beginning. Nothing. But on the end, we've been a team. Another challenge with this old commercial diving was wearing this old heavy equipment, never comfortable, always too big. But I never complain. I always found a solution. The suit was too big, so I used duct tape and wrap it around me, keep it on me. My helmet was leaking because of my small leg. So I used tape and tied it hard. My eyes were popping out. Uh, I was doing my job. <laughs> so I always tried to adapt. But I always was this miniature diver with the big bubble head. So through all this, my hard work, sometimes maybe not so hard, <laughs> I finally had enough experience, enough confidence and contacts, and I got my first job on the North Sea. I was so happy and so excited, but also quite nervous, because all the story of this big North Sea, hard work. So North Sea is fast moving, high workload, no room for error, constant pressure to achieve results, with highly experienced teams which are very difficult to infiltrate. But I constantly proved that I can do the same work. Even when it comes to any kind of task, work, I perform on the same level like everyone else. And even when I'm much smaller than most of them, or all of them, <laughs> I gained the trust and confidence because this was the most important for work as a team. Another challenging aspect of my profession was living far away from land on the sea for months or weeks as the only woman on this big ship or rig, which, say there was about 100 guys or even more, and just me very often. So, yeah, that was quite uh, unusual, difficult, but at the moment there's no problem at all. So with my previous experience working with the other cultures, I thought the big North Sea industry will be more compatible for women. But I very quickly learn that it's not. Most people have no problem with me being there, but there are still some which believe that there is no place for females. But regardless of what they think, I have been working as a commercial diver for 15 years now. And even doing different work, like training with, underwater, uh, with the rescue submarine, uh, piloting underwater robots, or now working with as an assistant of underwater camera for the big Hollywood movies, I still am still very proud about this commercial diving work, and it's still fascinating me. But this is not the end. There is one more challenge. I'm struggling to be accepted as a female. 
I'm trained for and I'm qualified for. It's saturation diving. We call it sat diving. So what is about saturation diving? It's the system which allows divers to go much deeper, about 350 meters and much longer. They breathe different mixture because the air is poisonous at this depth. So they use helium and oxygen, so-called heliox, which gives them this funny Donald Duck voice, like, hello, hello, I'm a diver. So imagine these big guys, you know, with this funny voice. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, I love it. So this kind of uh, diving involves very long decompressions, up to a few days sometimes over a week even, which would be very inefficient and dangerous. If, imagine doing one dive and then one week of the compression. So to avoid it, the divers, similarly like spacemen, live in the separate chamber on board of the ship, which is pressurized to the depth of their work. And they do the decompression only on the end of the trip. They live there. They sleep there, they eat, they shower, they toilet there for up to four weeks. They cannot just leave. They've got a long way up there to come back to this atmospheric pressure. So this very complicated system involves a lot. That's why it's the whole team working on their life support. Because if something goes wrong, it could potentially be fatal. To transport divers from this saturation system, these chambers, to their work, the divers use the diving bell, which is under the same pressure, like in the chamber and the depth of their work. It's very similar like airlock system on the space capture. So it's connecting to the chamber, take divers, go down, to their depth of the work, transport them, divers can leave, do the job, and then come back to the chamber, and next team is coming. It's 24 hours like this. It is really similar, like being on the moon. You can just imagine. So there is more women floating around in space <laughs> that are sad diving on the North Sea. Now women are more accepted in demanding male-dominated work. I would like to imagine more women start diving, and perhaps soon I will get my chance too. Thank you.